God bless you, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to uh, our Sunday morning worship. Uh, at this time, we are preparing to receive the word of God. And in doing so, we want to pause for a moment of prayer. God, thank you for this season. Thank you for this time that we have. Thank you for allowing us to pause for a moment of Advent. God, we are preparing our hearts. We're preparing our heads and we're preparing our homes uh, for your arrival. And we pray, God, that uh, as we prepare for you, Lord God, that we are expectant that you will show up and manifest yourselves in our, in your, in our lives. God, we pray uh, that uh, although the season is bombarded uh, with shopping, Lord God, let us hear from you. Now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, let us all say amen, amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, if you would, turn with me to the book of Matthew, the first gospel, uh, the first gospel, Matthew, uh, the first chapter, and we'll read uh, Matthew 1, verses 22 through 25. Matthew 1, verses 22 through 25. When you have it, just say amen. When you have it, just say amen. I ain't heard nobody yet. There we go. There we go. There we go. So we want to read again Matthew 1, 22 through 25. And there you will find these words. I'm reading from the NIV, so perhaps you may read something just a little bit differently, but hear ye the word of God. The word reads thusly. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through his prophet. The virgin will conceive and bear or birth a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. He gave him the name Jesus. Brothers and sisters, for the time that we share, I would like to use as an Advent theme, blessed at a baby shower. Blessed at a baby shop. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect upon this fourth Advent Sunday, a Sunday of love, I'm reminded of when Petrina and I were expecting our firstborn child, Zion. It was an exciting and delicate time, a time of planning, a time of preparation, a time of happiness, but it was also a time of anxiety and a time of anticipation of our first child's arrival. As new parents, there were so many tasks to be completed with so little time that we had. The only things that were on our minds at that time was diapers, bottles, onesies, rumpers, and anything that the child would possibly need. And as a new father with limited resources, I was becoming overwhelmed because I was uncertain about how I would, uh, how I was going to be prepared for having everything that my firstborn child needed. That's how life is sometimes. 
Sometimes a bundle shows up when we are unprepared. That's how life is. A bundle shows up at a time where you are uncertain, at a time where you are unsure, at a time where you are unstable. But brothers and sisters, the blessing about when you are a child of God, no matter when the bundle shows up, and I'm not just talking about a baby, I'm talking about an unexpected experience in life. When that bundle shows up, if you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit helps you to overcome whatever obstacles that you face. But sometimes we feel like, brothers and sisters, that we are overwhelmed and underpowered. Have you ever been in that situation where you just feel overwhelmed and underpowered? It seems like the things in life are pressing you down without the resources to be able to push back and to move forward. That's how life is. Sometimes we get to the place and the point where we don't have the power but brothers and sisters, we have the many issues. But when I reflect upon the story uh, of the baby shower, I thank God for family and I thank God for friends because when I think about family and friends, they stepped in and arranged an age-old maternity tradition known as a baby shower. And I'm sure many of us, or most of us, have heard of a baby shower. And although in times past, men weren't usually invited, but as it has progressed and time has moved, it is now a communal occasion for everyone. A baby shower is important because it celebrates parenthood, it celebrates family, and it celebrates new life. As a matter of fact, in the African uh, religion and customs, they would arrange a mama toto which is Swahili for mother and child. This Afrocentric baby shower is a festive celebration where the expectant mother is showered with love, with support, and brothers and sisters, she's showered with gifts in preparation for the arrival of a newborn child. The Mama Toto focused on the spiritual oneness of the mother and the child and the interconnectedness to the entire family and the community at large. In other words, brothers and sisters, when the baby shower was had, we were all in connection with one another because of the birth of a newborn child. This was a celebration that gave a backing and a blessing to the family as it suggested that brothers and sisters, that we are all in this thing together. Brothers and sisters, what I share with you is that when you face anxieties, when you face angst, when you face fears, what I want you to know is that we are all in this thing together. When we face new presidency, when we face COVID fears, when we face a new normal, what I want you to understand is that we are all in this thing together. When you have health issues and scares, what I want you to understand is that we are all in this thing together. In essence, 
That's what Advent season really is as we recount the Christ narrative. We prepare our heads, we prepare our hearts, and we prepare our homes for the arrival of Jesus Christ. As we adorn our homes with Advent wreaths that bear the candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, we are reminded that God came down to creation to be in relationship with you and I. God came down to be in relationship with humanity, to be in communion with creation, to be in fellowship with us as God's divine family, to abide with us amidst our humanity. Scripture is fulfilled through the echoing affirmation of John. We listen to John in John 1, 14, which says, And the word of God was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld God's glory through Jesus Christ and the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father who is full of grace. But the defining and delineating difference is, is that instead of us coming uh, to shower the baby with gifts, the blessing about this baby is that this baby came down 42 generations to shower us with a gift. And it is the gift of life and life more abundantly. But before we examine this exegetical excerpt, I wanted to share something briefly about uh, uh, my experience with the baby shower. We didn't have a bed, we didn't have much money, we had exhausted many of our resources, but the priority was making sure that the baby had the appropriate and suitable baby bed. Katrina was hell-bent on having somewhere for the baby to sleep. It was okay for me for the baby to sleep in the bed, but Katrina wanted somewhere for the baby to sleep. So therefore, brothers and sisters, we ran to one of our uncles, uh, Uncle Kelly, uh, an uneated. Uh, we were talking to uh, Uncle Kelly. Uncle Kelly said, hey, look, we are going to buy you a baby bed. On the inside, I jumped for joy because I had spent all of my money. I was broke as a joke. But Uncle Kelly came through in the clutch. He said, I'm going to buy you a baby bed. So brothers and sisters, time passed, time passed, and we were getting closer to uh, the baby shower. Uh, we didn't see a bed, and and we were kind of getting anxious. We didn't see a bed. There was no bed at the baby shower. But brothers and sisters, as time passed, uh, as we got closer and closer to the end of the baby shower, I was getting uneasy and anxious because I understood that Petrina was about to go into the hospital and have the baby, but yet and still, there was no bed in the house. But all of a sudden, Uncle Kelly came through with the baby bed. I'm about to shout today because this is leading me to the front door of our text. And the front door, brothers and sisters of our text, says this. Are you ready? The front door of our text says this. Praise God for keeping a promise. Uncle Kelly kept his promise. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, today that God also keeps his promise. So we want to praise God because God keeps his promise. The blessing about the birth of Christ is that the Lord kept 
his promise. I want somebody else to understand that the blessing about the birth of Jesus Christ is that Jesus, the Lord, kept his promise. All this took place to fulfill. We look at the text, verse 22 of our text says, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord from the Lord's prophet. In other words, in Isaiah, the seventh chapter, brothers and sisters, Isaiah had spoken and he shared what God was going to do for humanity, but it took some time for that to happen. I know, and I want to deal with the scholars, <laughs> many scholars suggest that that wasn't a prophecy, and it wasn't a prophecy that was exclusive to Jesus Christ, because in the book of Isaiah, Ahaz was considering a young woman who indeed had a child. And brothers and sisters, in the semantics, uh, in the wording of it, we can get lost because what it suggested was that this was a young woman who was about to have a child. And in the next chapter, we see that the child appeared. Nevertheless, we must understand uh, that typologically, this was a part of a pattern of God's action whose culmination is within the works and the existence of Jesus Christ. And this was a sign or a symbol of consolation for the present uh, that helps one to be expectant about the future. In other words, brothers and sisters, this was a sign for the present that helped comfort us in the presence while we are going through hell and high water. It comforts us right now so that we can be hopeful and expectant about what God is going to do for us in the future. It's a sign and a symbol of consolation. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to hold on. Uh, we need to hold on to some things uh, that reminds us of the salvific work of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need to be reminded of what God has already done in our lives. Sometimes we need somebody just to put a fixture on our, the wall of our minds and our hearts so that we can understand what God has already done in our lives. Brothers and sisters, we need sometimes proof and evidence of what God is still doing. I'm reminded of my children <laughs> who oftentimes are afraid to sleep alone in their rooms. Many times to get Avery to go to her own room and to sleep in her own bed. Y'all hear me when I say this. Brothers and sisters, we have to call upon Sprinkles the unicorn. Thank God for Sprinkles the unicorn. Sprinkles the unicorn is her favorite stuffed animal. Sprinkles the unicorn acts as a comforter and one who consoles her so that she can sleep through the dark nights until she wakes up in the morning to see her parents again. It was a symbol of comfort. It was a symbol of compassion and it was a symbol of encouragement. All I'm saying to you brothers and sisters that many times throughout the biblical narrative God leaves his children who love to cry. Y'all help me preach this thing today. God leaves his 
his children who love to cry some symbols that he still loves us, some signs of hope, even though we face the bleakest of times in human history, during those darkest nights, during those times of cruelty and tyranny, during those times of slavery, God leaves the light of hope on so that we can be comforted even during those times. These symbols have to keep us, even though we feel like our Father is not present. These, these signs have to keep us, and they kept our forefathers and mothers through Jim Crow. They kept our forefathers and mothers through brothers and sisters, the massacre of East St. Louis. They kept our mothers and fathers through the Tulsa race massacre. They kept us uh, through brothers and sisters, the hardships that we face. And I'm persuaded that that same God will keep us through pandemics. The same God will keep us through political unrest. That same God will keep us. God gives us these symbols of hope to keep us when we even are feeling alone, when we are feeling depressed, when we are feeling oppressed. What I want you to understand that God still walks with you. God still embraces you through the Holy Spirit. And God is still God even though you don't see him. So the believer, for the believer, God fulfills his promise through the birth of Jesus Christ. God is a God who keeps his promise. And that blesses me to know that we serve a God who keeps his promise. While this is a shout-worthy point within uh, the passage and the pericope, I also want to warn you that there is indeed a tension in the text. And here is the tension. While we praise God for keeping his promise, sometimes God's promise can be puzzling. I want to say that again. I'm, I'm about to get happy for Joseph. Sometimes God's promise can be puzzling. Sometimes God's promise can be perplexing and sometimes God's promise can be prolonged. In other words, brothers and sisters, sometimes we don't understand what God is doing in our lives and sometimes what God is doing in our lives needs time to happen, but we've got to learn how to be patient. As a matter of fact, we see this in our text, that God's promises can be puzzling and perplexing. We look at the text, but one of the things about the text, brothers and sisters, God expands our faith by challenging us to embrace insanity. I know that the world we live in, we live in a world of cynics. We live in the world of Facebook unbelievers. Everybody know more than what they really know. But brothers and sisters, what I'm sharing with you is that brothers and sisters, God is expanding our faith because uh, he pushes us to believe or embrace Insanity. Somebody may be saying, well, what world, Reverend Letcher, what in the world are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. In the insanity in the text is for Joseph to believe that this woman is pregnant and she's a virgin. A woman giving birth without the participation of a male in the process of procreation. I don't know about you, but that sounds insane. God uses the things 
that are almost too unreal to be real. That's how God moves. That's how God works. Sometimes we've got to understand that God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes God's promises, they can be puzzling. Sometimes God's uh, promises can be perplexing. And sometimes God's promises can be prolonged. And when this happens, we must be careful because we can't fully grasp the promises of God. And brothers and sisters, when we cannot fully grasp the promises of God, we become perturbed. In other words, what I'm saying is, brothers and sisters, when we cannot grasp what God is doing when we cannot trace where God is going. Sometimes we get disturbed and sometimes we give up. Sometimes we become depressed. Sometimes we want to stop uh, in the ministry that God has called us to. Brothers and sisters, sometimes when we are not losing weight, when we, when we think we ought to lose it, sometimes when we are not making the progress that we think we ought to make, we give up, we throw up our hands, we hang our hops upon the willows, and we give up. But what I want you to understand is that you ought to embrace the promises of God because the promises of God are promises that you can take to the bank. This leads me to my next, my, my, next, uh, my next point. Brothers and sisters, my next point shares with you this, holding to God's promises, they are not always painless. I, I want to say that again. Somebody is dealing with some pains right now in life and you feel as though God has forsaken you. But if you look at this text and you believe in the text, even the mama and the daddy of Joseph had to hang on to the promises of God, but yet those promises to hang on to were not painless. Touch your neighbor. Say, neighbor, holding to God's promise is not always painless. I wish I had a church full of folks in here today so I can hear your shout. I want to push further to say this, that holding to God's promise will not always be easy, but it will always be worth it. I'm going to give you a little time to shout. Holding to God's promise might not always be easy. Might not always be easy to trust God. But brothers and sisters, even when you can't trace it, it might not be easy to always start on a journey that God has called you to. But you don't understand how you get there. It might not always be easy. But one of the things I share with you it is always worth it. It's not always painless, but for the parishioner, it's always profitable. As we consider the text, somebody may be saying, can you show me that in the text, verses 24 and 25? I'm glad you brought me back uh, to the text, parishioners. Although after hearing from the angel of God and accepting Mary as his wife, I'm sure as a man, Joseph had, uh, uh, even as he decided uh, to participate in the redemption of humanity, uh, I'm sure that uh, Joseph was not without problems and not without pressure. Joseph had a great deal of panic. He had a great deal of distress receiving the news about Mary's pregnancy. I mean, after all, it was known in the Hebrew culture that if there was infidelity in the marriage as uh, unfair and inequitable as this was, the woman would be put to death. 
I'm sure Joseph had some doubts. Perhaps he even had some regrets. And sometimes in this life and in this faith race, we might have some doubts, brothers and sisters, when God has called us some do, to do some things. We might have some doubts, we might have some pouts, we might have some regrets, and we might have some frets. But brothers and sisters, there are some times when God gives us instructions based on what you see around you. It does not make sense. But we've got to remember that we walk by faith and not only by sight. Many times it is unavoidable and inevitable that God calls us to participate in the story of redemption in such a way that when we start, we don't know how it's going to finish. And there will be times when God interrupts our plans and he plans something different. It's sometimes in our lives, God will interrupt our direction and move us to a place of detour. Sometimes God moves in our lives and what we thought made sense, God will move it to a place of nonsense. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 27 that God chose things uh, that uh, this world uh, considers to be foolish. God chose the things that this world would consider to be foolish to confound those who think they are wise. God chose the things uh, that this world considers to be weak to shame those who are powerful. And I want to encourage you that when you are sure that God is indeed leading you, you ought to be like David. When David had the understanding, he had such faith that he said, trust in the Lord with all of thine heart and lead not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge God and God will direct thy path. Although, <laughs> I want to share this with you. I know there's somebody probably standing up at home right now, but I want you to understand that when God directs you, he may be directing you down when you think God is directing you up. He may be directing you uh, uh, to something differently than you think that God would be directing you. Ask Moses when you think uh, you ought to be fighting, God is commanding you to be still. Ask Joshua when you think you ought to have a sledgehammer and a pickaxe in your hand to demolish a wall, God will have you singing and marching around the wall for seven days. When you think, brothers and sisters, you ought to be doing one thing, God will call you to do another thing. When you think you are looking for a king that is coming in all of his glory. He's showing up in a manger. It's amazing that as we look through biblical history, we think God is coming one way, but he shows up another way. I'm just about done, brothers and sisters. I'm just about done. But the last thing I'll share with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my seat. I pray uh, that your Christmas is blessed. But the last thing that blesses me about this text uh, is this. They called his name Emmanuel. 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 And I, 
I pray that someone sings that song, Emmanuel, we worship you. Emmanuel, we worship you. Last thing I share with you is Emmanuel, hearing the name of Emmanuel eases our anxieties and it ignites our adoration. Hearing the name of Emmanuel, it eases our anxiety. I don't want to hoop right now. It eases our anxieties and it ignites our adoration. Our text says, they should call his name Emmanuel. It means God is with us. For any believer, any believer, if you hear the name Emmanuel, when you hear God's name, it ought to ignite, it ought to ignite your praise. When you hear the name Emmanuel, God is with us, one who saves, it ought to ease our anxiety. It ought to ease our anxieties. It ought to calm our angst because what it says in Hebrew is that God is among us. No matter what you're facing, I want you to know that you have God in your presence. No matter how dark your night gets, no matter how depressed you think you are, I want you to know that God is still in your presence. This portion of the pericope excites me because we are not merely celebrating the birth of a baby, but we are celebrating the fact that God became a baby. And because God became a baby, that means that God kept his promise. It might have taken a while. We might have been looking around, waiting on him to manifest, but God kept his promise. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Keep in mind that the child uh, was born but the son was given. The child was born, but the son was given. I, somebody may have missed it, brothers and sisters. There, there's somebody that's missing it right now. A child was born, uh, uh, but a son was given. A child was born unto us, but a son was is given. This is because the son existed before the child was born. The virgin gave birth to the child, but the child existed before the virgin became pregnant. Therefore, the son was given and not born. Jesus Christ didn't make his debut on the first Christmas morning in Bethlehem. He existed before creation. Because the word of God says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things that were made through him and without him there was nothing made. We celebrate this time today because God came into a dying world through the person of Jesus Christ. And not only did he come into this world, this dying world through his son Jesus Christ, but he came into a dying world so that we might have life and have life more abundantly. We thank God for coming into our hearts, 
Thank God for coming into our heads, and we thank God for coming into our homes. Brothers and sisters, the door, the virtual door of God's house is open. The virtual door of God's house is open. The virtual door of God's house is open. I want you to be blessed at this baby shower. Advent season is only a baby shower. This is a baby shower. We're preparing for the coming of the Lord. We're preparing for him in three ways. Uh, brothers and sisters, we celebrate his birth, but also we celebrate his life as he desires to enter you. But then also, brothers and sisters, we wait expectantly on God's return. Because when he returns, he's not coming as a precious baby, but he's coming as Lord and judge. The door of the church is open. In this time of uh, agnosticism, there's so many people trying to explain away the virgin birth. Don't listen to them. Brothers and sisters, you've got to have some level of faith that even in the immaculate conception, uh, Mary consented to the welcoming of the Holy Spirit. The door of the church is open. Don't be overwhelmed again about agnostics who uh, try to again explain away the virgin birth of our Savior. You need a time, or you need a savior rather. You need a savior in times like these. The door of the church is open. The door of the church is open. With that being said, brothers and sisters, we want to pause uh, for a concluding prayer. God, we thank you for these, your children. We pray that something was said during this broadcast or this virtual airing uh, that would prick the hearts of your children. God, we pray uh, that this has been inspiring. We pray that this has been encouraging. And we pray that this has been evoking. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.